It's a good afternoon class. See, I'm used to teaching a class. And hopefully you will enjoy some of the good benefits of a class. See, a class is a learning experience for both teacher and students. And also, one of the good things about this class, a seminar at camp meeting, is you don't have to take the final exam, right? You're exempt from the final. I can assign all of my students A's. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for prayer as we start. Lord, as we consider this topic of creation yet again, we want to rejoice in the message that you are our Creator God and that you are still performing the new creation in our hearts. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Just before I go through some of my PowerPoint slides, I want to highlight, some, somebody might ask, well, why is this such an important subject anyway? I mean, it happened in the past. When everyone believes it happened, it was in the past, right? And why not just let the past be bygones? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to make the point that someone can't love Jesus if they don't believe exactly how I do about creation. That's not the point that I'm making. But I do believe that the doctrine of creation is an important, a very important teaching of Scripture. In fact, sometimes you can bump into people that are not into doctrines at all. They'll say, well, we don't need doctrines, just give me Jesus. Or all that is important is that we love Jesus. Well, you've got to remember that, that the, te the biblical teaching about Christ is itself a doctrine of Scripture. And how do we know about Jesus except through the pages of Scripture? For that matter, I think that sometimes people have a misunderstanding of the word doctrine. Doctrine is simply the unfolding of the biblical truth about God, and we want to understand God better, don't we? Isn't that our goal? So I guess I would simply say, I, I would highlight a couple of verses just to introduce today if somebody should ask, why is this so important? Well, I believe that biblical faith, Seventh-day Adventist faith, Christian faith should be Christ-centered. Do you agree with that? It should be centered on Christ. And if we look at the message of Scripture, we see that Jesus is our Creator, isn't He? Turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And somebody might say, well, Greg, doesn't it say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? Yes, it does. But, but the active agent in that creation is Jesus, the Son of God. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the, what does it say? Was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then what does verse 3 say? All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And how do we know who that Word was? Well, look down at verse 14. And the Word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. And so we see that Jesus was the active agent in creation. And just in case the, the one passage isn't enough to verify that for you, it's good when you're doing Bible studies with people sometimes to be able to, to point out multiple passages. Let's look also at Hebrews chapter 1. Beautiful passage in Hebrews chapter 1. beginning again with the start of the chapter long ago. At many times and in many, in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days He has spoken to us, how? By His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He, what? Created the world. And then look at verse 3 at how majestic it is. He is speaking of the Son. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint 
of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Isn't that a marvelous passage? The exact imprint of God, the radiance of his glory, upholding the words, upholding the worlds by the majesty of his power. So I think that we need to recognize if we are diminishing God's role in creation, then we are lessening the emphasis on Christ in some way because Christ is the active agent in creation. Christ is our creator God. And not only that, but look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to look at verse 17. Because what it emphasizes for us is that creation is not just something that took place in the past in this sense. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Several of you have spoken to me at this camp meeting about how in describing your, your journey, your story, that you've experienced a spiritual renewal in your life. Maybe you didn't grow up as a member of the Adventist family, or maybe you didn't grow up as a member of any church. Or even if you grew up in a church going home, you, you reached the time when you needed to take your parents' faith and make it your own. And, and you experienced that new creation. Each one of us needs to experience that, don't we? That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, said to Nicodemus, unless a person is what? Born again. That's the new creation. So I'm glad to emphasize on the basis of Scripture that creation did not just take place several thousand years ago, but God's work, his recreative power is still going on in our hearts today. And then as we talked about last night in the sermon, I look forward to the time when God will create a new heaven and a new earth. Still the same powerful, loving God. Okay, let's look at a few of the things that we want to look at. If I can get my slides going there. Let's see if we can uh, get this advancing there. I might have to have you do it manually. We tried to do it earlier, and it was, you know, when this is the way Murphy's Law works, right? Sometimes it... Try turning it on and off. I wonder if maybe you can just advance the PowerPoint slides manually if they're not going to do it with my handheld thing. There we go. Am I doing it or are you doing it? Oh, okay, I think I'm doing it now. Maybe he just needed to wake it up or something like that. Taking his afternoon siesta. You remember our theme verse from the Old Testament, the grass withers, read it with me. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands how long? Stands forever. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's word is enduring, and that it lasts, that it is invaluable? And then the New Testament verse, what does it say? Your word is what? truth. And so if God's word proclaims something to us, we believe God's word, don't we? In God's word, we find truth. Now, a few emphases of the biblical creation account that we have discovered. And again, this is not a, this is not an exhaustive list. You maybe can add your own themes to it. But here are some themes that I see as important when I read Genesis 1 and 2 and other biblical passages that talk about creation. Divine power. Don't you see that permeating that passage? God said, let there be light. And what does the Bible say? There was light. God said, let the dry land appear. God said, let the waters teem with creatures and so forth. Divine power. Plan and order in creation. 
You notice that the creation week, it moves through a sequence. There's an orderly plan. It builds towards a crescendo with the creation of, of Adam and Eve in God's image and then the icing on the cake, the Sabbath of rest. Life is a gift from God. We didn't self-assemble, did we? We didn't just come together by natural law and chance. God created life. Perfection in everything. God saw all that He had made. And what does the Bible say? It was what? It was very good. And then we see some beauty and variety in the natural world. I don't know if you enjoy watching the creatures. I enjoy watching sometimes the, the birds that come and feed at a couple of bird feeders in our backyard. Now, I have cautioned my wife that we can't feed every bird in College Dale, but she seems to want to try sometimes. And sometimes we will talk about, well, what kind of bird is that? Well, look at the red markings on its, on its shoulders. Or look at the shape of its beak or something like that. Have you noticed what wonderful variety there is in the natural world? Isn't God a lover of beauty? The natural world is not drab and colorless, but God loves beauty. And then we see humans as the crowning act of God's creative work, created in the image of God. And then we see the Sabbath of rest. Now, one of the reasons why I highlight these items as key emphases is these are not themes that would emerge from the account of evolution, are they? So if one believes in an evolutionary account, then you're going to come to a different theology, a different view of God. Because evolution has chaos and randomness and molecules self-assembling. But these are themes that you see in the biblical account. Now, I think it's good to review occasionally what our own church believes on the doctrine of creation. Some of you may be aware that this fundamental belief, number six, underwent some slight revision at the last general conference in San Antonio, Texas. Maybe even some of you went to the general conference, although that would be a, a bit of a drive, a little more than a stone's throw from Missouri. But let's just remind ourselves of what the Adventist church believes about creation. God has revealed in Scripture the authentic and historical account of his creative activity. He created the universe, and in a recent six-day creation, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Notice the quotation marks, because that's quoting from Scripture. And rested on the seventh day. Thus, he established the Sabbath as a perpetual memorial of the work he performed and completed during six literal days that together with the Sabbath constituted the same unit of time that we call a week today. In other words, it's indicating that a day doesn't represent a million years or a thousand years or something like that. The first man and woman were made in the image of God as the crowning work of creation, given dominion over the world, and charged with responsibility to care for it. When the world was finished, it was declared, when the world was finished, it was very good, declaring the glory of God. Now, do you think that's a pretty nice statement? You can see what they've tried to do is to take the various biblical passages, and you see a reference to the passages there, take the various biblical passages and to draw from them phrases that would come together and make a statement of faith on creation. I think that's a good representation of what Scripture says and what, of what the Adventist church believes. I think that's a statement that is faithful to Scripture. And a little later on in the presentation, I'll come to a voted statement that Southern Adventist University, the university at which I teach, a voted statement that, they, that was voted there about creation. Then a couple of Ellen White quotes you might find useful on this topic. Second Testimonies, or excuse me, Fifth Testimony, page 25. In God's Word alone, we find an authentic account of creation. 
In other words, since none of us were there, and since in Scripture God has revealed the account, we should trust His Word in that account, shouldn't we? And then here's another, another one that's a little longer. I was then carried back to the creation and was shown that the first week in which God performed the work of creation in six days and rested on the seventh day was just like every other week. The weekly cycle of seven literal days, six for labor and the seventh for rest, which has been preserved and brought down through Bible history, originated in the great facts of the first seven days. Some of you may know this already in her day, there was circulating these ideas that were contrary to what Scripture teaches. For instance, on the origin of species, though it had been written earlier, was first published in 1859, uh, during the early, before the Adventist church was officially organized as a church, and during the earlier years of Ellen White's ministry. And so these ideas were already circulating around, and she made it clear that she supported the biblical, biblical account of origins. Now, I'd like to contrast the biblical picture, which we've looked at and emphasized, and we will move through this pretty quickly, but, but just so you can see what some of the alternative views might be, both in modern times as well as we're going to look at one story from ancient times. Sometimes people will say, well, the biblical story and all of those stories from Mesopotamia and Egypt, they're just alike. Well, I'd like to look at one of the stories with you, and we will see that they're not just alike. I phrase the question in this way. I understand that there are some extra-biblical creation stories. What similarities and differences do they have with the biblical account? And you can find these on the Internet. They're not hard to find at all. But here is one of the more well-known, one of the more famous ones. Let's just look through it quickly together. And as we go through it, I'm just going to read it quickly, see if you can follow along, and try to make note in your mind of, of some of the differences and maybe a couple of similarities you see with the biblical account. In the beginning, neither heaven nor earth had names. Apsu, the god of fresh waters, and Tiamat, the goddess of the salt oceans, and Mamu, the god of the mist that rises from both of them, were still mingled as one. There were no mountains, there was no pasture land, and not even a reed marsh could be found to break the surface of the waters. It was then that Apsu and Tiamat parented two gods, and then two more gods who outgrew the first pair. These further parented gods until Ea, who was the god of rivers, and was Tiamat, and Apsu's great-grandson was born. Ea was the cleverest of the gods, and with his magic, Ea became the most powerful of the gods, ruling even his forebears. Apsu and Tiamat's descendants became an unruly crowd. Eventually, Apsu, in his frustration and inability to sleep with the clamor, now I've heard of mom and dad getting upset when the children won't let them take a nap, but this is kind of excessive, isn't it? <laughs> inability to sleep with the clamor, went to Tiamat and he proposed to her that he slay their noisy offspring. Tiamat was furious at his suggestion to kill their clan, but after leaving her, Apsu resolved to proceed with his murderous plan. When the young gods heard of his plot against them, they were silent and fearful, but soon Ea was hatching a scheme. He cast a spell on Apsu, pulled Apsu's crown from his head and slew him. Ea then built his palace on Apsu's waters, and it was there with the goddess Damkina he fathered Marduk, the four-eared, four-eyed giant who was god of the rains and storms. The other gods, however, went to Tiamat and complained of how Ea had slain her husband. Aroused, she collected an army of dragons and monsters, and in its head she placed the god Kingu, whom she gave magical powers as well. Even Ea was at a loss how to combat such a host until he finally called on his son Marduk. You're going to see Marduk will be the hero of this story. Marduk gladly agreed to take on his father's battle on the condition, condition that he, Marduk, would rule the gods after achieving this victory. The other gods agreed, and in a banquet they gave him his royal robes and scepter. Marduk armed himself with a bow and arrows, a club and lightning, 
And he went in search of Tiamat's monstrous army. Rolling his thunder and storms in front of him, he attacked. And King Gu's battle plan soon disintegrated. Tiamat was left alone to fight Marduk, and she howled as they closed for battle. They struggled as Marduk caught her in his nets. When he opened her mouth to devour him, he filled it with the evil wind that served him. She could not close her mouth with his gale blasting in it. He shot an arrow down her throat. It split her heart, and she was slain. After subduing the rest of her hosts, he took a club. He took his club and split Tiamat's water-laden body in half like a clamshell. Half he put in the sky and he made the heavens. He posted guards there to make sure that Tiamat's salt waters could not escape. Across the heavens he made stations in the stars for the gods. He made the moon and set it forth on its schedule across the heavens. Now have you noticed we don't have any humans yet in this, do we? Gods bickering and fussing and feuding and fighting with one another, but no humans yet. From the other half of Tiamat's body, he made the land which he placed over Apsu's fresh waters, which now arise in wells and springs. From her eyes, he made flow the Tigris and the Euphrates. Across this land, he made the grains and herbs, the pastures and fields, the rains and the seeds, the cows and ewes, the forest and the orchards. So things are starting to appear, but not in the same way as God created them, right? Marduk set the vanquished gods who had supported Tiamat to a variety of tasks, including work in the fields and canals. See, he's pressing them into servitude. Soon they complained of their work, however, and they rebelled by burning their spades and baskets. I guess you could call this the first labor action, the first strike. Marduk saw a solution to their labors, though, and he proposed it to Ea. He had Kingu, Tiamat's general, brought forward from the ranks of the defeated gods, and Kingu was slain. With Kingu's blood, with clay from the earth, with spittle from the other gods, Ea and the birth goddess Nintu created what? Created humans. So humans finally appear. On them, Ea imposed the labor previously assigned to the gods. Thus the humans were set to maintain the canals and boundary ditches, to hoe and to carry, to irrigate the land, to raise crops, to raise animals and fill the granaries, and to worship the gods at their regular festivals. Quite a story, isn't it? Now, what would your theology be if that is how you believe that the earth came into existence, that that is how humans were created? It gives a completely different picture of God, does it not? Victor Hamilton states in his handbook on the Pentateuch, I am persuaded that the implications of the creation story of Genesis emerge most dramatically when it is compared with the creation literature of, for example, Mesopotamia. For it is in the comparison of literature of identical general, general theme that the distinctiveness of biblical faith and message appears. Do you hear what he's saying? The Bible is distinctive. It's unique. It's not like these other stories. It was inspired by God. You see the difference in these other stories in Scripture. In these other stories, we have humans who are groping in their spiritual darkness and blindness, reaching out, trying to imagine what God might be. In Scripture, the reverse is taking place. It is God revealing Himself to us, describing what He is like in Scripture. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. When I come introduced to God, my imagination in the beginning. Going into time. Yes. Genesis one one. Go on to that's right, that's right. What imagination we use now, we want it to be sanctified imagination, led by the Spirit of God. So, 
He also perceptively observes a study of mythology helps the believer to see how ancient men tried to answer ultimate questions about life and reality when the light of revelation had not dawned upon him. In other words, how were they trying to answer these questions that are of importance to humans? You know, it's been said before that all humans ask three probing, vital questions. What are those questions? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Right? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? And if we are groping in darkness, groping blindly, we won't have an adequate answer to those questions. Hamilton says, interestingly, the answers provided to those questions by ancient man are not all that different from the answers provided by modern but unredeemed man. In other words, the answers that are provided by naturalistic evolution are as far off the mark as the answers given by some of those ancient accounts. Yes? It's from the Mesopotamian area. It's called Enuma Elish, and it's one of, you can find multiple accounts, and so it would be from Mesopotamian religion. And particularly in Babylon, you may know, Marduk was considered one of the leading gods. And so this would have been part of the Babylonian collection. I think one form of it, it was found at several different places, but one part of it was found from the library of a king named Ashurbanipal. They excavated his library and found a lot of documents. Reading in Yuma Elish certainly makes me grateful for the biblical account. One shudders to think about what our self-esteem would be if an Yuma Elish provided the true account of how human life originated on this planet. Just a profound difference. And, and I have listed for you some of the contrast, and you can think of others. You notice from the very outset... Enuma Elish was polytheistic. What does that mean? Believed in what? Many gods, multiple gods, and the gods are procreating more gods along the way. So it's polytheistic. Did any of you ever read the books, maybe when you were growing up, maybe your parents read them to you, or maybe you read them to your children? I used to read them to my children some, and I think I enjoyed them as much as they did. The mission stories of Eric B. Hare, Dr. Rabbit, Case of the Haunted Pagoda. And, and if you remember some of those stories, they make the point that, that when you believe in multiple gods, the pagan world is a very fearful place because you always have to be on your guard lest you have upset or alienated or angered one of the gods. And maybe you're worshiping one God, but there's another God that's more powerful than that God. And so you constantly live in fear. If we've grown up in Christian homes or even believing in monotheism, we maybe don't recognize what a value, what a blessing that is. The biblical teaching of the unity of God. You know, the basic confession in Deuteronomy 6, the Lord our God, the Lord is, what does it say, one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Right. No, no, who would want to live forever in a world like that? In fact, you see in the second point is the behavior of the gods. They're feuding and fussing and fighting and killing one another. The word theocide means killing of the gods death of the gods, and, and this is what they're doing. Heaven and earth formed from the corpse of a slain god. That doesn't give dignity to the creation, does it? Heaven and earth formed from the corpse of a slain god. Humans formed from blood, spittle, and clay. And somebody might say, well, yes, we're formed from the dust of the ground in Scripture. Yes, it's true. But we also were, are given life when God breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. That's an intimate touch, isn't it? Breathing into the nostrils the breath of life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 
Yes, yeah, in other words, he would quote scripture, but only quote it partially or twist it or misinterpret it. Yes, and that's the, right, that's right. And then lastly, I would highlight the purpose of the creation of humans. In scripture, humans are the crowning work of God's created order. But in the biblical, I mean, in the Enuma Elish, did you see how there's something of an afterthought? Humans haven't even been created. The gods are complaining. We've got to work so hard. We, you, you've, you've got us working hard in the fields. Oh, yes, we'll create humans to do that servile work. Quite a different picture from what you see in the biblical account. Albert Bayliss responds in this way. And so here is our first answer to the question, who am I? The Babylonian myth would answer, you are a product of the gods to make their life easier. Modern myth would assert you are a product of random chance in a purposeless universe. I don't think either of those answers is adequate, is it? The Bible says, listen carefully, you are a personal creation of Yahweh who cares for you, has created you male and female, has placed you in an orderly and good creation as his representative ruler. This knowledge of God's order and created relationships is considered obsolete by many people today. And as a result, our age suffers the anxiety of enjoying no secure place or significance in the world. When we leave the teaching of creation behind, we're drifting at sea without an anchor on some very important points. Okay, what is the meaning we were discussing yesterday? Somebody was wondering, well, are there only two different viewpoints? Is there just creation and evolution? And it might be helpful for you to be acquainted to some, with some of these other terms that you might hear. What is the meaning of some key terms as they relate to the controversy between creation and evolution? And I'll give you a few, the definition, and you can tweak and nuance these definitions some, and you can come up. I've got a sheet in my folder that has a number of different positions. But here are several of the major positions. Biblical creation. I believe if one believes in biblical creation, meaning that you are getting your view from Scripture, you mean that God created all major life forms. It doesn't mean that no change has taken place since that time. And by the way, sometimes some Christians have made a mistake of falling into the trap of what I would call the, the fixity of species, that, that no change takes place. And we, we know that that's simply not true, that, that God made us with a certain flexibility. My, my children don't look exactly like either my wife, and they don't look like me either. But obviously, they're not cats or dogs, they're humans, right? And so there's a certain flexibility, and I mentioned this the other day, that uh, dog breeders, if you made a cocker spaniel and a poodle, you get a cockapoo. That, that doesn't violate the teaching of Scripture on this point. But, but we would say that God created the major life forms on this earth over a, a period of one literal week several thousand years ago. And I don't, I don't think the Bible gives an exact date for creation. Uh, in fact, I think we need to be careful about demanding precision when the Bible doesn't give it. One writer suggested that, I think the date was that Adam was created on Friday morning, October, and he specified a specific date in October, 3922 B.C. or something like that. Well, that's not a biblical datum. It, it's, it's not something that one can determine from Scripture. Sometimes people might say, well, there are questions that, that I haven't resolved. For instance, what about some of the amphibians or a duck-billed platypus? Was it created with sea creatures or was it created with land creatures on day five or day six? You know, that's not a hill I'm going to die on. There are questions that we don't have a final answer to. What I would say is let's speak with conviction and confidence in that which God has revealed. And some things God will reveal to us in eternity, won't he? And we can take those questions to him and answer them then. 
The biblical creation, God created all major life forms on this earth over a period of one literal week several thousand years ago. Progressive creation. God performed multiple creative acts over a period of millions of years. Now, again, this isn't in harmony with Scripture, but sometimes people will say, well, I'm a progressive creationist. And what they mean by this is when you get to a gap in the fossil record, maybe you're going to progress from reptiles to birds or birds to mammals, that, that God steps in and performs a creative work. What this is an attempt to do is an attempt to, to mesh, to harmonize evolution and creation. And then there's a viewpoint called theistic evolution. Sometimes people will say, well, I believe God started it all, but he did it through the process of evolution. And it seems to me that then your God is disappearing off the scene. And you really don't have a God who is actively involved in his creation any longer. And then there is naturalism, sometimes known as materialism. And that holds that all of life, including its advanced forms, developed over time we might say long periods of time, they believe, solely, that's a key word there, solely, what does solely mean? Exclusively, only through the operation of natural laws. In other words, in this viewpoint, there's no God involved in it. This viewpoint would be either officially atheistic or agnostic. God is not involved. And so what I would point out, oh, it, still naturalism. All living forms have arisen from a single source that itself came from an inorganic form. Don't be confused by that technical word. What does inorganic mean? Simply what? Non-living. That life came from non-life and it happened by natural law. So that's materialism or philosophical naturalism. Now, what I would point out is that all of these viewpoints, other than biblical creation, believe that death existed for a long period of time before humans ever existed on the earth. And that's why when you go to a museum and you maybe see a, an, an exhibition of dinosaurs, and unless it is a creationist-based museum, what will it say about the dinosaurs? It will say that they were wiped out, they became extinct. Sometimes it's said through a meteorite striking the earth about, you know, how long ago they say? About 65 million years ago. So they don't believe that dinosaurs and humans coexisted. They don't believe that they lived together. Now, somebody might say, well, Greg, you're taking a lot of time to talk about this subject. What's wrong with taking the attitude toward creation that's espoused in the bumper sticker that says, God said it. Have you seen that bumper sticker before? I believe it. And that settles it for me. Well, I want to answer this carefully and say that there's nothing wrong with being faithful to God's word and lining up with God's word. However, I want to give a gentle critique to this viewpoint in this, in this light. I believe that God wants us to understand his natural world. Do you believe that? That God gave it to us to understand. And so if I'm standing in a classroom at Southern Adventist University and a student raises his or her hand and says, I have a question about creation, and I say, don't trouble me with your questions. God said it. I believe it. That settles it for me. Is that really an adequate approach to this subject that I think should reveal God's glory to us. I think God wants us to understand his book of nature. I think also, as the Bible says, we should be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us. And I think sometimes, not always, but sometimes people might give a, a slogan or a bumper sticker like that which places a, what I have called, a veneer of piety over intellectual laziness. In other words, I don't want to be someone that is unwilling to probe into Scripture, to try to understand God's 
natural world, isn't it true that the Bible is meant to probe our deepest thoughts, to challenge us, to, to cause us to explore more fully the Word of God? You know, I don't think that God's Word has anything to fear from honest, open investigation, does it? Truth is not going to crumble. If it's God's truth, it can stand the test of, of careful scrutiny. And so I'm happy after struggling and grappling to understand God's Word, and there are some things we don't have final answers to. I'm happy to say, as did Martin Luther, and it's good to quote Martin Luther, as some of you are aware, this year is the 500th year anniversary of his posting on the, of the 95 Theses on the church door at Wittenberg. What did he say? My conscience is what? Is captive to the Word of God. That's a good place to be, isn't it? To be committed to God's Word. Sometimes people might ask this question. Can one be a good Christian or a good Adventist and embrace a non-biblical view like theistic evolution? Well, as a teacher and a pastor, sometimes people will say a variety of things. Can I be a good Adventist if I don't worship on the Sabbath day? Can I be a good Adventist if I don't attend church regularly? Can I be good ad a good Adventist if I believe in the secret rapture instead of the visible second coming? I, I think that sometimes questions like this are, are test questions to try and corner someone. So you can choose how you want to answer the question. This is what I would say in response to this. First, I don't take it upon myself as an individual to determine who is a good faithful Adventist and who isn't. You know, ultimately that involves a matter of the heart, doesn't it? And, and we leave that in God's hands. He's capable of handling that. But this is what I would point out. If it is self-consistent, then any view other than biblical creation accepts the following. Look at those things. Common descent from simple life forms. Maybe you've heard of the teaching before of common descent or common ancestry, meaning that we all came from a primitive form of life. Death before what? Sin. And, therefore, if God created it, and he created it th that way, he's using evolution to perform his work of creation, then death is a what? Divinely intended part of life. Doesn't that reflect poorly on God? Doesn't they say something about his character? If he's using predatory activity, the law of claw and things, survival of the fittest, to get to the higher life forms? You see, that is what those other viewpoints say is that God used the evolutionary process to get to the higher life forms. So I would point out that there is a danger of what I call a la carte Adventism. You know what it is a la carte when you go to a cafeteria and you eat a la carte? That means you're not just charged one fee for the buffet meal that you can eat all you want. You only pay for what you take. When I was young and would go to a, an a la carte cafeteria, I didn't have enough good judgment about what was nutritional and what wasn't. And my mother would be somewhat dismayed because I would go through line and I would be choosing French fries and mashed potatoes and gravy and all of these starches together and probably very little in the way of fruits and vegetables a la carte, taking it item by item. And have you noticed that sometimes people want to do that with Adventist faith or biblical faith? Well, I'm going to take this and I'm going to leave this. And I think it is important to have a coherent, consistent faith. I used to work as my, my grandfather was a bricklayer for about 60 years, and I had the privilege sometimes of working as his, we call it his mud man, you know what that is, mixing his mortar, carrying his bricks to him. And one of the things that I learned is that he always had to lay a good foundation. And the bricks were all interconnected with one another, weren't they? 
And sometimes laying that first row or two of bricks, it took him a little extra while because he would bring out his tool, called it a level, making sure that the foundation was level. And if you start tampering with creation, isn't it true that you're destabilizing the whole foundation like we talked about yesterday? The Sabbath, marriage, the new earth, a number of biblical teachings are connected with this. I want to have a consistent, coherent faith. So I believe that person, like I said, I'll leave their heart to God. But I believe that person is not being a consistent biblical Christian, consistent Adventist Christian, if they say, well, I believe that Jesus loves me, but I don't believe in creation. Certainly, I'd want to continue in dialogue with that person and, and show them the value and the importance of creation and what the biblical teaching is. Can evolution be harmonized with Christian belief? Sometimes people have, asked, have, have ventured an answer to this question. Now, I want you to note two competing quotes from the same person. Stephen Jay Gould, until his death several years ago, was one of America's foremost evolutionary scientists, taught at Harvard University. He's somebody the media would go to when they wanted a quote on this topic. In one place, he said, science and religion are not in conflict, for their teachings occupy distinctly different domains. Evolution is entirely compatible with Christian faith. Now, that's what he said in one place. But I want you to notice what he says elsewhere, and then you will understand a little better what he means by this. Biology took away our status as paragons created in the image of God. Before Darwin, we thought that a what? Benevolent God had created us, as if to say, now we know better. And then finally, why do humans exist? I do not think that any higher answer can be given. We are the offspring of what? History. You understand what that means. Time, chance, natural law. We must establish our own path in this most diverse and interesting of conceivable universes, one indifferent to our suffering and therefore offering us maximal freedom to thrive or to fail in our own chosen way. Now, this is the same guy that said that evolution and creation are not incompatible with one another. And if you look at it carefully, what he's saying that, well, if you want to be a religious person and imagine in your mind that it makes you feel good to believe that there's a creator God somewhere, then we'll leave you alone. But don't think that that's how it really happened. Don't bother us adults with that. We're figuring out, making use of science, we're figuring out what really happened. But just like it might make you feel good to believe that Santa Claus comes down the chimney on Christmas Eve, even so, if you want to believe in a God, it makes you feel good, but it doesn't really have a basis in reality. This is what he's saying. So in light of quotes like that, I don't think that evolutionary thought is compatible with biblical faith i think that they are distinctly different viewpoints i heard an sda scientist say this and i actually heard this comment and and by the way this is not to make you suspicious of of adventist scientists or theologians although there is some ferment in the church on this you're probably aware of it i work with a number of faithful and committed scientists and we meet together about once a month on the Southern Adventist University campus and we will choose a book for the school year and, and read it, take several chapters at a time and discuss it together. And I'm blessed to have colleagues who are physicists, chemists, biologists, and we come together and discuss. And, and, and we've got committed creationists there. I'm thankful for that. So this is not to engender suspicion on your part. It's just to say that whatever you hear, we need to examine it by the Word of God. And that includes what I say as well. I heard an SDA scientist say, The Bible speaks to morals while science speaks to how life begins. Let's let each speak to their respective area. Is there a problem with this attitude? Well, how can the Bible call us to a moral principle of honesty if it is untruthful itself? 
How can the Bible call us to lives of self-sacrifice and commitment to God if the God of the universe used predation, death, and survival of the fittest as his method of creation? Do you see the inconsistency that is found therein? So I think the Bible speaks both to morals as well as how life began. In fact, it might surprise you or maybe not to know that the New Testament has over 25 references or allusions to Genesis 1 through 11, and all of them consider Genesis 1 through 11 as a true historical account. In other words, it's not just Genesis that somebody is throwing overboard if they don't believe in creation, but creation is found elsewhere in Scripture as well. I'm going to skip ahead, and by the way, I'm happy um, the slides, my PowerPoint slides were taken to the uh, camp meeting computer here, and I'm happy for you to have all of them, but I've got to finish on time today. I have enough, I, I've got the teacher in me, and I know when I have a time limit, and they're also going to have a book sale in here afterward today and might have some setting up for that to do, so I want to be fair for those who come afterward. Uh, I would just say on this that there's some variety among Adventists, among Bible-believing Adventists, on the issue of is the universe young or is it only the earth and the life forms that are, that are found down here? And I would just encourage you to keep in mind when, when Scripture does speak with some flexibility on something, we need to allow for that flexibility. And so the question is, when the Bible says the earth was without what? Form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. How long did that go on before God said, let there be light, and, and he performed his, his creative work on this planet? Well, we don't know for sure, do we? Was it immediately before? Did it, for that matter, before sunrise and sunset in the six days of creation? We, we serve an eternal God, don't we? In fact, I think some of our evangelical Christian friends make a mistake on this because there are some who feel that the whole universe was created, every inhabited planet, at the time that this earth was created. And I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. I think Genesis 1 and 2 are talking about the creation of this earth and our biosphere. Are you following me with this? And, and with the insights that we gain from the writings of Ellen White, we're aware that there were other created worlds that were created prior to to the creation of earth. And when did that take place? I don't know. Again, we have an eternal God, the Alpha and the Omega. He was there when it all started. He'll be there when it's all over. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that trouble my sleep tonight. And so if somebody says, well, the rocks and minerals, the inorganic substances of which this earth is formed, they appear to be older than life on this earth. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not troubled by that. I think the key issue is when did God perform the six-day creation week? And on the basis of Scripture, I would say that that was several thousand years ago. We don't have the exact year, but not numbering in the millions and millions, but in the several thousands. And we'll look at a statement on that in a moment. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, I had the privilege of being a part of some of these discussions that took place in our church we looked at some of the evidence supporting the biblical account. Uh, maybe you've seen some of this evidence before, the evidence for the complexity of life and organic systems, evidence for the fine-tuning of the universe. Let me just give a brief illustration of this. Suppose you were to go and rent a car or purchase a new car and and as you went to sit in the car you noticed that the seat was located just the right distance from the steering wheel for you and the steering wheel was just at the right height and then you you turned on the radio and it had it preset to whatever stations you like all of your favorite stations and and the temperature was adjusted just perfectly and and you might start to think that Somebody had prepared this vehicle specifically for you. Somebody who knew your likes and, and dislikes. Well, 
even some secular scientists have noticed that the universe seems to be fine-tuned. Sometimes it's called the Goldilocks principle. You know what Goldilocks is known for? Well, this bed is too hard. This bed is too soft. This bed is just right. What is it? The porridge is too hot. The porridge is too cold. The porridge is just right. The Goldilocks principle would suggest that it's, it's just right. Let's look at a few examples of this. The sun faithfully provides us with just the right amount of light and heat necessary for life on the earth. If the sun were just 5% closer or 1% further from the earth, it would rid our planet of life. Isn't that something a secular person would have to say it just so happened, right? Gravity. The force that keeps our galaxy, suns, and earth together. If either gravity or the electromagnetic force varied only slightly, this would be disastrous for stars such as our sun. Have you heard of Isaac Newton before? Famous scientist that lived several centuries ago. So then gravity may put the planets in motion, but without divine power, it could never put them into such a circulating motion as they have about the sun. And therefore, for this, as well as for other reasons, I am compelled to ascribe the frame of this system to an intelligent agent. We know who that intelligent agent is, don't we? That's the living God. This is one of the most striking things, whereas Isaac Newton lived a few centuries ago. Anthony Flew, until a few years ago, was one of the world's most famous philosophical atheists. He's the type of individual that would go around to a university campus and would debate in favor of the atheist side. But he came to the point where the more he looked into some of this evidence along the lines of what we're talking about, the more he felt compelled to believe that there is some object, some being, some power out there. In fact, it was so surprising to his erstwhile friends that they accused him. They said, you're old, your mind is addled. You're no longer thinking straight. He said, no, I am thinking straight. I am driven to this by the evidence. The most impressive arguments for God's existence, this is just in recent years from Anthony Flew, the most impressive arguments for God's existence are those that are supported by recent scientific discoveries. You know, sometimes you might say there are none so blind as those who will not see. Fred Hoyle said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests, look at the wording that he uses here, suggests that a super intellect has what? Monkey, that's kind of an interesting verb, isn't it, in light of Darwinian evolution, has monkeyed with the physics as well as with chemistry and biology, and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question, driven to a position by the evidence. I want to come down and I'm going to close with this. Um, the Adventist Church revoted in recent years our position on creation. And I just want to conclude with the position I had the privilege of serving as the chair of our committee at Southern Adventist University, and we had representation from biology, chemistry, physics, somebody from the English department there to make sure we wrote it in good English. <laughs> and here were our conclusions. See if you think this captures nicely the biblical picture. In response to the International Faith and Science Conference Organizing Committee's report, an affirmation of creation, the General Conference Executive Committee at its annual council asked all members of the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist family to proclaim and teach the church's understanding of the biblical doctrine of creation. The Executive Committee also called on all boards and educators at Adventist institutions at all levels to continue upholding and advocating the church's position on origins. We, the faculty, staff, and administration of Southern Adventist University, respond to this call with the following affirmations. And these are our seven affirmations on creation. See if you think it captures well the biblical teaching. Number one, 
We affirm the primacy, authority, and trustworthiness of the Bible in all areas of inquiry it addresses, including the origin of the natural world and the various kinds of life created therein. In other words, we start with what? Scripture. The Bible. We take our teaching from the Bible. Number two, we affirm that Genesis 1 through 11 is an accurate and historical account of the events it presents. The description found therein is reaffirmed throughout the, throughout the Old Testament, and every New Testament writer and Jesus himself explicitly or implicitly affirms the historicity of Genesis 1 through 11. Sometimes people say, well, you know, Genesis was written so long ago, maybe we just dispense with that and, and, and hold on to the rest of the Bible. It's interwoven, isn't it, friends? Intertwined. Genesis is trustworthy. Number three, we affirm the supernatural creation of a beautiful and perfect world in one literal week of six consecutive contiguous 24-hour days of creative activity followed by the Sabbath of rest. The main point of that statement is that it was a literal week, seven literal days. Number four, we affirm that the creation week and the origin of life on earth took place recently, a few thousand years ago, and that there was no life on earth prior to this time. See, some have advocated, well, there was a creation millions and millions of years ago, and then it was destroyed, and then a recreation. I don't think the Bible teaches that. Number five, we affirm that death came about as the result of human sin. See, the focus on this is where did death come from? I don't believe death came from the hand of God, do you? Jesus says, I am the what? Resurrection and the life. In fact, we need to be careful. I know what people mean sometimes, but sometimes when somebody dies in an accident or they die of a disease, somebody comes and says, well, it was God's will. You have to be careful about that. It is true that, that God's permissive will allows this great controversy to run its course, but death was never part of God's perfect will, was it? He is the resurrection and the life. There was no death in the world as originally created, and there will be no death in the new earth as restored by God. Aren't you thankful for that? Look forward to that day. Number six, we affirm the value of Ellen White's endorsement of the biblical teaching on the early history of earth, specifically a literal six-day creation, God's rest on the literal seventh day, a short chronology for life on earth of a few thousand years, and a global flood. And you notice how the flood is intertwined with this also, because if you don't have a global flood, then you don't have an explanation for some of the, the geological features that we see on our planet. So it's intertwined together. Number seven, we affirm that the doctrine of creation is foundational for and interconnected with other important biblical doctrines, including the and this is not an exhaustive list, but a few of them, the inspiration of Scripture, the Sabbath, the character of God, the plan of salvation, marriage, resurrection, and the new earth. Those are pretty big and important teachings, aren't they? If we dispense with those, we've lost something valuable. After those seven statements, we said we join other members of our worldwide church, including those at the Iowa-Missouri camp meeting. And proclaiming and teaching the biblical doctrine of creation, living in its light, rejoicing in our status as sons and daughters of God, and praising our Lord Jesus Christ, our Creator and Redeemer. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, thank you for this time to reflect today on this important topic of biblical creation. Today, may we rejoice in our status as your sons and daughters. We look forward to the time when you will create a new heaven and a new earth. that will be marvelous and perfect and beautiful as your original earth was. May that day be soon. We pray in the name of Jesus, our creator and redeemer. Amen.